Yeah, is now a good time for tax reform here in Community Matters uh, with tax attorney Roger Epstein. Welcome to the show, Roger. Hi, Jay. So nice to be here with you, even though we're 6,000 miles away. Ah, we could be next door. It's the same. So let me Great. let me uh, ask you, you know, to follow up, okay, on conversations that you and I have had um, over the years since 2017. There was a tax reform act, and it was called reform that was euphemistic. Uh, Donald Trump put in place. Uh, he sort of crammed it down the throats of Congress and the public back in January of 2017. It was the first thing he did. Yes. Um, so my, just to summarize our conversations in the past, was that tax reform? Was that the kind of tax reform we need in this country? No, it wasn't. It was definitely tax reform. In fact, uh, many, uh, uh, many people who aren't in a tax industry uh, don't realize that was the largest reform bill, the largest change in the taxes since 1986. That's how many changes were in there. Changes to the way we deal with international business, uh, changes in the, in the tax rates, and um, uh, all, all, all of the changes virtually that we've had in the tax law since, since Reagan became president have been to lower the taxes on the wealthy. Uh, the theory under republicanism is uh, if if the if the businesses big business pays less in tax, uh, that will have more money into circulation. They can use the savings to hire people to expand, and that will create a rising tide, which will raise all boats. Isn't uh, that the trickle down theory that President Hoover used in the late twenties, which resulted? one of the factors that resulted in the depression yes it yes it it definitely was trickle down economics were also discussed by reagan uh even eisenhower talked about trickle down economics um uh, the truth of the matter is and it doesn't take much uh, uh investigation to find it uh, we have dramatically skewed uh, our, our uh, income inequality mm. uh, in the last 40 years, uh, really starting in 1971 uh, with a Republican um, a paper, if you will, from Lewis Powell, who before he became a Supreme Court justice uh, was the uh, lawyer for the tobacco industry. And it, as a, as a, a back, uh, uh, slap to the 60s of the liberalism of the 60s, he came up with a plan to uh, essentially avoid communism and socialism, you know, what the, what the conservative was worried about, and turned it into uh, 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 a domination of big corporations and the government together uh, at the expense of the worker. Uh, we don't have unions anymore. Uh, the tax rate, when I first started in the tax industry, I was an internal revenue agent in 1967. The highest rate was 70%. It had just come down from 90%. So people were doing fine. Actually, those days were the best economics in the history of the country. And people were on an equal playing field. If you got out of, uh, you could go to college for nothing. State University was $200. California schools were free if you graduated from a California high school. When you got out of school, you could buy a house. I remember uh, making $10,000 at age 24 and being able to buy a house for $15,000. Since then, so the key is the relative value of services and capital was much more closely connected. So when I say I could buy a house for a year's and a half's wages, today, if you make $35,000, you can't buy a house for 10 times that or 20 times. Yeah, so especially here. The relative value between what you can earn for your services and what you have to expend to buy capital goods 
has gone so dramatically out of skew that you can't really today even work hard enough to create capital to buy into the real estate market, which is the main the main thing I'm talking about as a comparison. And the guys at the top, Jay, in the in the uh, late '60s, early '70s, they were making 30 or 40 times what the guy on the shop floor was making. Today, it's 400 to a thousand times more. So the guys at the top get it all. The guys who have the ownership interests and the capital, they get it all, but it hasn't trickled down. Well, it's trickled down. It hasn't flowed down to the guy who is out there working. And if your services aren't tied into capital, like a real estate broker or an investment banker, or actually law firms now, Big law firms have their fees tied in with the size of the project they're working on, not on an hourly basis. Mm -hmm. But interesting. Uh, it, and 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 so we've just we've 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 created what our founders did not want to have, which is an aristocracy of the rich. And well, let's let's go to the question of what how, what effect did the Tax Reform Act of January 2017 under Donald Trump have? on the process you have just described? Well, I would say it was just another nail in the coffin. What happens is we don't have enough money to provide for the safety net that Ronald Reagan talked about for our people because we're not, the, the wealthy people aren't paying in their fair share. I don't care about fair, enough to keep the country going. Well, what's interesting is that right after that bill was passed, right after Trump signed it, the like was the day after. Um, what's his name? Paul Rand, Rand, one of the one of the yeah, uh, Rand, Rand Paul, Rand Paul. Immediately, the day after that bill passed, he said, "Oh, gee whiz, we're not going to have enough money to fund Social Security. Uh, right. We'll have to cut back on the safety net." The day after. And yes. so that meant they all knew, the Republicans all knew at that time uh, they were cutting, they were cutting uh, benefits to the people. I'll tell you, I'll tell you uh, uh, some, I think, devious things, okay? Uh, there was a push for many years in the 80s and 90s for a flat income tax. Everybody was going to pay 15 or 20 percent of their income, which I've had Many people, not just rich people, tell me, well, isn't that fair? All right. The concept in the income tax is a graduated rate because the more money you make, number one, the more you can afford to put in. And number two, the more you have benefited from the system. So let me give you an example. A family making $50,000 a year is asked to pay a 10% flat tax, $5,000. Well, they're just at the margin now. They're, they're actually in Hawaii, of course, they couldn't possibly live on $50,000 a year, even two people, much less a family of four. So that $5,000 hurts like hell. Now they got $45,000 back. The guy making a million dollars paid in 100,000. And he's like, what do you mean I didn't pay enough? I paid 20 times what that other guy paid. Well, he's still got $900,000 left. I'm not saying we got to take all his money. I'm just saying he's got $900,000 and the other guy's got $45,000 and can't buy food on the table. So what are we thinking of? The reason we created a graduated tax system is just for that purpose, just for that concept of, of spendable funds, available funds. And if you don't take it from the guy who has the 900,000 left and take another 100,000 or 200,000, so he's only got $700,000 left. He benefited from the American system that allowed him to make that money. He, did, he benefited from all that's good in the country, the fact that our courts are legitimate, the fact that 
that supply chains are legal, the fact that people follow contracts, the fact that, that we have created a system uh, of capitalism, which is very good. When I talk about how things were in the 60s and the 70s, Jay, we haven't changed the system. We haven't gone anywhere. We were capitalists then, and people were paying 70,000, 70%, and we're capitalists now. Let me, let so, me change yeah. the subject a little bit, Roger. <clears throat> you know, one thing um, that's happening in the country, in the various states, especially the red states, is they're, they're giving up any, any pretense of having an inheritance tax. Um, yeah. They're knocking it off. Most recently, we talked to somebody from Nebraska. They're trying hard to knock that off. Mm -hmm. um, so I think after a while, you can see more and more states knocking off so what sometimes is left as a fairly modest inheritance tax. At the same time, the federal government used to have a, a much more mm, robust estate tax, um, which was at, at higher rates and lower, lower exemptions. Um, and uh, now we don't have that anymore. And the estate tax reaches only a small number of people. Um, very rich people may have to pay estate tax, but most, most rich people don't. The bottom line is you can achieve um, aristocratic wealth over a few generations because nobody is taking that back from you. You know, you have kept your $900,000 or whatever number you were using, um, and you keep it. And the estate tax doesn't really take it away from you. And it goes from generation to generation. It, what, what kind of policy is there? And um, what, what has the trend been over the past you know, few decades? Well, um, we, we started when I, uh, the, the exemption level is the key. Uh, because the rate has always been pretty high, 40, 50 percent, uh, which is substantial. Um, uh, but the exemption, when I first started in 1967, was 60,000, 30,000 for the wife and 30,000 for the husband. Today, it's 22 million. So you're right, we don't really have an estate tax federal and some states are lower. Hawaii has a, 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 a significant estate tax, but it's still, I think, three and a half or five million. So it's not 60,000. And, and again, 60,000 was, was a lot higher number than 60,000 is today, but it wasn't, you know, uh, whatever that number is, 10, 20, uh, uh, 100 times more, okay? Uh, more than 100 times, 200 times more, okay? So it, 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 we have basically eliminated the estate tax by getting the Republicans to call it a death tax, by increasing the exemptions it, it, from, it was, it was the big jump was in the, the second Bush administration. And he pushed it from about four or 500,000 up to three and a half million. And, uh, and then Obama, for some reason, I will never understand, or I hope I will understand someday, he could have allowed, he could have done nothing and allowed it to go back to a million. But instead, he pushed it to five million. Then Trump came in and it's five million plus a, a cost of living increase. So it went to, uh, uh, it kept going higher. And then Trump doubled down on it. He doubled it. And now it's 11 and a half for each person. So 22 plus million dollars, which, you know, how many people have that kind of money? Very, you're talking really up there in the one or two percent, uh, uh, half of one percent. In its own way, this, this evolution is worse than the evolution you describe in the income tax, because oh, it allows worse. the accumulation oh, of worse. enormous wealth. Yeah, no, the, the, the estate tax got passed in 39, I think, just before World War II. And it, again, in part to raise money, uh, but also uh, to uh, uh, pay for the, uh, to, to keep us from having 
this aristocracy of the rich. I really think it would be hard for a historian to look back and not believe that the founders of this country were very much against aristocracy. The concept of individualism, of equality, it was meant to eliminate the system in Europe. And it was very uh, uh, unique, but we've allowed it to creep back in. As Ben Franklin was asked after the Constitutional Convention, what kind of government do we have? He said, a republic, if you can keep it. Now we're losing it now for many reasons, but on this score economically, we're losing it because when you have the money, you also have the power. And I'll tell you, I want to double down on the estate tax because here's something that many uh, uh, tax lawyers understand and accountants, but for some reason, the Republicans have been able to hide this. Uh, when they uh, 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 were looking, what bill was this? I think it was the two th oh the 2017 bill when they when they increased the tax rates. I mean, when they increased the exemption for estate tax, Mitch McConnell said, we're looking everywhere uh, to pay for this. One of the ways they paid for it was to eliminate the moving expense deduction for employees whose employer makes you move from Cleveland uh, to New York. <laughs> Another way was to require employees to pay a tax on a free parking that the company gave them as if it was additional income. That's how they paid for it. Now, one thing that they somehow seemed to miss, when they put in the estate tax, they said, look, you're gonna have to pay a 40, 50% estate tax on the value of what you own. If you paid uh, $100 for something and now it's worth a thousand, there's a capital gain tax, an income tax to pay. So it's not fair to hit you twice. So what we're gonna do if you include that property at $1,000, pay your estate, you don't have to pay your estate, just include it in your estate, then we're going to raise your tax basis to the, the, what you put in the estate, the $1,000. And if you sold it the next day, you wouldn't have to pay an income tax. So you pay $100, you have a built-in gain of, of, of $900 to current value, you're in the estate tax, and now it raises up. So you can, okay. They now we got a $22 million base. How many people in the country own property that has appreciated from a hundred thousand to a million? Or we were talking about the increase in capital value. Okay, nobody except the upper, upper, who knows what the percentage is, pays a state tax. But somehow Mitch and the most brilliant tax lawyers that he has at his hands in the Joint Committee on Taxation couldn't remember that they didn't eliminate the step up in basis. So now as a rich person, not only don't you pay an estate tax, when you die, you get a favor from the government that all of your income tax on your built-in capital gain goes away. Thank you, Uncle Sam. Well, you know, it's, it sounds to me just from this uh, really short discussion that it's been political. It is uh, ideological. Uh, it is more political, more ideological today. Uh, the Republicans over the past few presidents and generations um, have are largely responsible for these trends. Uh, these trends are really anti-democratic anti and anti-social safety net. So the question I put to you, Roger, is uh, is it time for tax reform? And what does that look like? Jay, it's way beyond time for tax reform. The wealth gap in our country, I think, is significantly related to the income tax and the estate tax. And you can go back and look 50 years and see when, when the rates were much higher, we had an egalitarian society where you could live the American dream, work hard, study hard, make enough money to have a decent living. Our kids today know that they're never gonna own a house unless their parents give them a house or a down payment for it. So is it time? Yes, it's time. And there's lots of ways to do it. The simple way is to just start raising the rates. There is, remember this, an income tax is only payable if you have income. 
even after COVID, it doesn't hurt the companies that say, hey, business was terrible. Okay, then you don't have any income. Don't worry about what the rate is. But for those billionaires who increased their wealth by 50% during COVID, why the hell shouldn't they be paying 70%? Uh, uh, the Republicans have another thing that's really sleazy. They say, look, our corporate tax rates are higher than any place else in the world. Our income tax rates are so high. They don't acknowledge that every one of those countries with a higher rate and some, I mean, with a lower rate and some even with higher rates have a value added tax. All of Europe has it, all of Japan has it. And so I listen to people in the treasury department. They say, if you wanna lower corporate tax rates, you're gonna to have to institute a VAT. The Republicans know that, they don't care because if you have a million dollars, you can only spend 300,000 anyway. And so what do you care about a sales tax? You're reinvesting, not in goods, not to stimulate the economy, like the guy at the bottom would, like the guy who's an employee would, but you're, you're making extra money so you can raise, bid for more capital and raise the price of capital against the guy who doesn't even have enough money to make a living. I mean, I, I'm not exaggerating. This is where we are today. So is this the time? Yes. What, what, about, what about, is it time to do reform on the estate tax? Well, uh, if you believe in an estate tax, then of course we don't have one. And why do we have a step up in basis for income tax if we don't have an estate tax? And, and the estate tax never brought in a ton of money. So it's more of a question of, do you believe in eliminating or, or deferring the aristocracy of the rich. And I really believe that's, you look at, we have the Koch brothers and 50 other examples of people who might as well be princes and dukes because they control the king. And, and uh, uh, yes, I think so, but I, it's a different philosophical question. You need to have an income tax because you got to pay for roads. Look at the messes. I just drove down from New York to Maryland. Half the damn roads are being refurbished because of deferred maintenance. This, this bill that they have now, it, you know, there's road work every, there's all kinds of stuff that's just messed up in this Eastern corridor. I just drove 250 miles and it's all over the country. So should, should the rich not have to put in more when they have the capital or should we all just live in a society where we've got how many people sleeping in the streets? How many people can't afford to buy a house? Roads and bridges falling down. There was a bridge, I, I don't remember if it was in DC or New York. I think it was in New York. They had to close it uh, because it, 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 it was so in such bad repair, they were afraid it was gonna collapse. I mean, this is the United States of America. Yeah, and well, remember what happened in Italy. Bridge did collapse. That yeah. could happen and has happened here. But yeah. let me let me ask you this. You know, so right now we have two infrastructure bills. You know, uh, one is the bipartisan bill for what is it, one point two trillion, I think, and yeah. the other and the other is the uh, reconciliation bill, um, which also has a lot of infrastructure. Three and a half. Three and a half trillion. Well, three point three point five a half. Three point five trillion. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, president keeps on saying that we we have a way to pay for this. We're gonna we're gonna tax the wealthy. I, I don't know offhand, maybe you do, where the tax reform is, whether it's in the bipartisan bill or in the reconciliation bill. It's in one of those two. And in order to pay for an improvement of the roads in the Northeast Carter, what have you, around the country, so many other points, um, the, arguably we need tax reform to do that. So my question to you is, are we going to get tax reform to do that? Or are we going to wind up not getting tax reform somehow and all this, you know, daily conversation, tug of war about the infrastructure bills um, and wind up having either A, failed infrastructure, B, some new infrastructure, but not other new infrastructure, and C, no system to pay for it. 
leaving us with a you know significantly larger national debt. Yes, yes. Well, the truth, as we all know it, is our Congress has been dysfunctional for 25 or 30 years. We can't make decisions. Uh, and when you when all your your effort is is devoted to making the other side look bad, it's impossible to come up with sensible legislation. And uh, will we get there? I, I don't even understand uh, what the what the Republicans want, except to make Biden look bad. I don't understand. They know there's a need for this infrastructure. When they're in control, when they have the presidency, they're not worried about the, the debt. Uh, we increased the debt incredibly during the Trump administration, and nobody was worried about it. We, Dick Cheney, when he was working for George Bush as the vice president, he said deficits don't mean anything. So what are we talking about? I don't know. The question is, will our dysfunctional government become somewhat functional? Will we become reasonable at all? And frankly, uh, uh, we're in a place where half the country thinks that the Republican idea of governance is okay. And they think that, I believe, for two reasons. One, the economics are too complicated. But they know one thing, the South and the Midwest know they don't like big city Northern Democrats. They, you know, for all these reasons, Donald Trump will poke you, poke them in the eye on their behalf while he's stealing out of their wallet, of course. And, and, and the second thing is uh, they have distorted, the Republicans have distorted the process so that abortion and, and, and white supremacy become more important than the substance of running the government. And that's just where we are. So I give Biden a lot of credit for bringing these bills up. They're necessary. They were necessary during the Trump administration. Uh, they were necessary for a long time. It's like deferred maintenance on your house. Where does the money come to pay for it? Well, we've already seen that we have skewed our capitalist system so that the owners of businesses and the owners of real estate have most of the money. If it doesn't come from them, it cannot come from the guy who is just barely making ends meet. In Hawaii, how many people work two or three jobs or the husband and wife work two or three jobs just to make ends meet? So we can see it, we can talk about it, but somehow we're either gonna get it done or we're going to continue with failed infrastructure and more people sleeping in the street. And Jay, it gets to your philosophy of, of what does it mean government of the people, by the people, for the people? Does that mean you can carry guns and you don't have to take uh, uh, an injection for, uh, or, or whatever? Does that mean individual freedom? Or does it mean that the majority of people should have a decent life? should come together, the government should be for the people and of the people and, and not the enemy of the people, which is how they've been painted by the Republicans. And I don't mind being uh, as, as you know, uh, one-sided as I can be. Look, I represented every large company in Hawaii and uh, every large, many, many of the largest companies in the world, in China and Japan, and I don't have anything against them. They, they're a lot of great people. They're all doing their job. Uh, they don't have to pay any more tax. I didn't allow them to pay any more tax than they owed. It's the governments and it's the pressure from these big companies that won't raise the taxes that we need to support an environment, to support a society uh, that allows people to move up in the system. This is what I learned as a kid and you learned and we all had an idea that that's what the United States stood for, an ability to work hard and move up. And uh, we've, we've, we've lost it. And if we let it get worse, it'll get worse. Well, that's my question here. You know, you're describing, um, you know, a decline in general on tax policy. 
over, over several decades and generations. He was describing a, a decline in the quality of life of most Americans, maybe 99%, really, in, in our lifetimes in, in, yeah. in recent years. <clears throat> and, you know, I think, I think we agree that the chances that the government will be able to uh, address this properly, make good tax policy, make good tax reform uh, in order to, you know, balance this thing so people in general uh, will have a better life and the next generation will be as good or better off than the current generation. Um, we're not optimistic about that from what we know today. But drawing on the lessons of history, Roger, what happens when a country keeps declining in terms of tax policy, tax reform, the distribution of wealth and property? What happens? What do we know about that? Well, we know, we know from the uh, Depression, from the Great Depression, the system collapses. And then all of a sudden, what Franklin Roosevelt, who was called a traitor to his class, discovered or believed, we're going to have a revolution. We're going to have a revolt by the, the you know, like the, I don't want to say communist, but something like that, where people say, what am I doing? I can't even afford to, to raise my kids. I can't, I, I, nothing is working. And, and so that's what history shows becomes the problem or you become a, a, a third world country where people, why do people come to the United States? We're having all those immigration issues because other countries are much worse. You have no opportunity. Here you have some left, some opportunity. Maybe you can't buy a house anymore, oh, but at least you can have a car and you can have a job and you can have food on the table if you work your butt off to do it. And Jay, I want to say one other thing that I think is really important. And I know a lot of my old clients will not be happy to hear this, but I believe that the federal government is so bollocked up, the chances of them coming up with sensible ways to do this, that people are, is very, very small. And even if it happens now, look, they're talking about Republicans taking over. Uh, the House and the Senate in 2022. So, so uh, I mean, I don't know it, but I do know this. We live in a beautiful place with a lot of dedicated people who, who, who work hard, who have uh, a good consciousness, who believe in the concept of aloha. We could take our own state. It reminds me of years ago in the 60s, when they talked about states' rights meant segregation by the South. Now I think states' rights mean you gotta make your own economics. You gotta make your own way. Hawaii needs to look for its own way, not to depend on the federal government. If the tax rate in, in uh, uh, the feders came down by 20%, 35, what would it come down from uh, uh, during the Bush, I mean, the Trump, and before that, well, we, we're not getting as much money from the federal government. So isn't it fair for us to raise our rates? I know we already raised them to 11%. Maybe we have to go higher. And not only that, and this is something that could be really controversial, but I don't think it's fair that the value of hotels are $700 million, a billion dollars, and none of the people that work for them can make a living working for them. I don't mean none of them, but that most of them. What is it we're doing? Why do we give our precious land right at the ocean? The ocean land, uh, you know, up to the vegetation line is all public property. Why is that access given freely to a hotel that built their hotel there so they can pay less than a, a minimum wage? So one of the things I think to talk about taxes locally is you create something like a wealth tax or a value tax on hotels. And you make it very significant so that we can get enough money to carry our resources. But you then give them a credit if they will pay a livable wage to employees. 
And you have to set it up in a certain way that you can't scam the system. And that's not that uh, simple, but it can be done, I believe. And what about it? You know, the hotels, they can't take their business and run away. <laughs> Other people can. Car manufacturers in Detroit have left for other countries, but nobody's picking up their hotel and moving on. So what happens? The value of a hotel is based on a capitalization of its earnings. So if you raised everybody's pay to $25 an hour so they could live, the earnings of the hotel would go down. It wouldn't be eliminated. It would go down. And the value of the hotel would go down. Well, you know what? The value of the hotel in the last two or three decades has gone out of sight. It's gone up so much higher than wages, it's ridiculous. Partly bid up by the Japanese in the 70s, partly bid up by raising of, of rates on, on customers. Now, if you go too far and you push people past their mortgages, then now you may collapse the system or bankrupt it or what, whatever. So there's an issue there. But on the other hand, somebody's going to want to buy those hotels because they're beautiful. And if they're not worth a billion, let somebody buy it for 500 million and run it. Because one thing I learned in school, in college, risk versus return. The reason you make money in the capital market the reason you make money in real estate is because you're taking a big risk. Well, one of the risks is that the guy before you, you ended up being the greater fool. Did you ever hear the greater fool theory? When it was worth 300 million, you sold it to the guy for 500 million. Now he sells it for 800. He's taken out 80% mortgages and all the. There's a risk in that business. And, and the risk is. Nobody can live in Hawaii <laughs> except the guys that own the hotel. So I, I just, you know, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, who's in charge here? Is it, well, is it I mean, what you're talking about is really, it really touches me. It resonates <clears throat> everything I know. We need the money in the state for our own infrastructure, for our social safety net. We have to find ways to raise it. <laughs> There's no final way, really, all things considered, especially in view of the failure of the federal government uh, right. to do a meaningful tax reform. But I ask you this question, my last question today. Yeah. What's the likelihood in our in our system of government here in Hawaii A, that these kinds of reforms um, could be adopted and implemented? Well, I'll give you an example of the real estate investment trust bill that we were trying. Real estate investment trust pay zero income taxes in Hawaii. And our calculation is they sh should be paying 60 million. And we worked it out and the legislature passed it unanimously and Governor Ige vetoed it because for some reason he thought it wouldn't bring capital here. Why do we want to bring capital here that doesn't contribute any tax money <laughs> to the community? <laughs> There's a question. What, you know, I'm not saying that we don't need jobs. I'm not saying that we don't need hotels. I'm just saying that we're getting killed by that industry because we're scared to death of them. And, you know, I wish I knew, Jay. There's a million people in Honolulu. Why aren't they voting for people who want to see significant change? Why do we have politicians who don't understand anything? It's because it's complicated and it's not. And everybody wants things to be simple and uh, you cannot do it. Back in, you know, George Arioshi, who was a governor for what, four terms? He created a whole plan for the island of Oahu that's held up pretty good today. And he had it, and I believe George had it in his mind to do what was best for the community. And I, and I don't think that people are necessarily evil. I just think they don't understand how we got where we are today. 
we've got the same system. We're still capitalists. I'm not talking about changing the system. I'm talking about how did the system get itself so out of whack that you cannot earn a living in Honolulu, which is such a desirable place to live, which is such a desirable place to visit. Why can't we get there? Can we get there? Yes, we can get there. You talk to people like Gary, uh, you know, our friend Gary in Kauai. Who Gary used, Hoosier. Gary, Gary Hoosier. He will tell you the way to get there. And other people, and Gavin Thornton at Appleseed, they'll tell you the way to get there. We can get there. Uh, FACE is another, there's a lot of community sources. But I think the Kupuna have to step up. People like you and I have to step up and more of us to say, okay, we're the elders. We're going to try to come up with ways so that our community can live decently. We're our out of time, Roger. We'll have to we'll have to leave it there. Uh, Roger Epstein, tax attorney uh, and philosopher, uh, <laughs> and and a really uh, brilliant suggestions today. This was a really special discussion. Thank you so much, Roger. I look forward to our our next show together. Thank you, Jay. You're doing a terrific job for the community, and I really appreciate it. And and you and I may be a little ahead of the curve. Maybe we'll get there in three to five years. Let's keep plugging away. Knock wood. Thank you. Knock wood. Uh, yeah. Aloha.